All right, guys, you know the drill. Most of you have been to these lectures before and are longtime cast members, but to anyone who's new here or needs a refresher, um, this is our Cornell Astronomical Society lecture series. We do these roughly every week for about five weeks per semester. Um, today's speaker is going to be Sophia. Sophia is a longtime cast member, and she's just a generally pretty great person. And uh, she's going to be talking to us about her research she did this summer with LIGO. Um, so on that note, uh, Sophia, take it away. Exciting. Okay, well, hello, you. So as I was introduced, my name is Sophia Arnold. Um, I'm a junior here. I am majoring in applied and engineering physics. And this summer, I was lucky enough to do research through the LIGO SURF program. Uh, LIGO being Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, which sounds like a lot of words, and it is, but by the end of this talk, you're going to understand what those lot of words mean. <laughs> um, I am so excited to give this presentation, and in it, I will be kind of introducing what LIGO is, what a gravitational wave is, and then also talking about upgrades to LIGO, specifically adaptive optic upgrades to LIGO and achieving higher laser power within LIGO's arms. So let's get into it. So here is the outline for my presentation today. I have delineated it into five distinct sections, which will kind of move you through both for, well, starting out first, what is LIGO? What is a gravitational wave? Why do we care? Then we're gonna get more into what I actually did. So a proposed improvement to LIGO is this thing called FROSTY, which is a very fun acronym. And uh, you'll learn what it means later on. I'm not going to tell you now to keep you waiting in anticipation. Um, and then we will talk about what I did for FROSTY to be implemented in LIGO, specifically developing an intensity noise GUI then applying, applying the GUI, because why make it if you're not gonna apply it? And then talk about the overall project synthesis, what I accomplished, what I learned, all of that fun stuff. So as I said, motivation, here I wrote future improvements to LIGO, but also what is LIGO, et cetera. So for starters, let's talk about what a gravitational wave is. So according to LIGO's website, a gravitational wave or gravitational waves are ripples in space time caused by some of the most violent and energetic processes in the universe. And I have a fun little video, which a lot of you have probably seen considering we are the Cornell Astronomical Society giving this presentation. However, I think it is very fun to see every time. So, the first prediction of gravitational waves was by Oliver Heaviside in 1893. In noting the symmetries between the behavior of the force of gravity and the behavior of the force of like electromagnetism, he had the idea that gravity might also have a wave-like behavior like its electromagnetic counterpart. And then after that, we waited about I think about 20 years until Einstein's theory of general relativity, in which we got the first major proponent of gravitational waves, because no one really took Heaviside seriously until Einstein came up with general relativity. And then people were like, hmm, maybe I should care more about this. However, the first real evidence of gravitational waves didn't come until it was directly measured by LIGO in 2015. So now let's talk about how you actually measure a gravitational wave. Because sure, we have this fun gravitational wave, but the tricky thing about gravitational waves is that they interact very weakly with matter, which makes them impossible to, to detect without the help of massive astrophysical events. And it also means that we need extremely precise instruments in order to actually detect them. Like we're talking about measuring something that's less than the radius of a proton. 
Like that's the mass or the um, length difference that we're talking about, like less than the radius of a proton. Like how, I can't even fathom what that is. So let's talk about how we actually measure them. Uh, so this is LIGO. It is one of the first things, but I don't think it was the first. It's just uh, effectively two massive Michelson interferometers each of which have two four kilometer perpendicular arms, as you can see, they make this L shape. And the general idea is that as we get a gravitational wave that passes through the earth, the contractions and contortions of space time that follow with the gravitational wave will directly impact the length of the arms of these long arms that we see. And that will result in a phase difference being read out in LIGO's detectors, effectively measuring the gravitational wave to an extremely high precision. So the cool thing, though, about gravitational waves is that in, once we're able to actually measure them and make this detection really effectively, we'll be able to get these uh, direct we will be able to get direct measurements from astrophysical sources that otherwise we won't be able to measure. Because things like electromagnetic radiation, because it has this strong interaction with other charged particles, it can be really influenced by whatever media it's passing through when it moves through space. Whereas gravitational waves, because it's so weakly interacting, it just moves through and gets to us pretty unchanged. So in making a detector like this that would be really precise, we would be able to probe these astrophysical sources to a level that would just be unachievable in any other capacity. So I hope that I've motivated this a little bit more for you uh, so that you, you're like, let's measure gravitational waves. <laughs> so even more still, when we're talking about measuring something that's less than the radius of a proton, we need to talk about how we actually do it, as I mentioned. And I want to mention some fun things that they do at LIGO, which really isolate their system from the outside world. So the first thing I want to mention is this quadruple pendulum, which they use, because it damps out these frequencies that they get from the Earth, and that isolates the test mass. And so it's, it's really cool, because they see all of these oscillations that just damp out through there. And they say that once they implemented this quadruple pendulum, they got their noise, I think down like a pretty, by like a factor of one half or something. Like this quadruple pendulum alone was able to isolate the test mass, which this thing, it's the mirror. It was able to isolate the test mass so effectively they installed it everywhere that they possibly could. And they're considering adding more of these chains because it, it just damps out these frequencies that they get from the Earth or the tidal waves that they see from the moon. Because as I learned, the tidal waves from the moon actually do affect the Earth too, which is interesting. And they really affect LIGO. So another really interesting thing about the effect of this is that when we have these arms and we have this experiment that's able to make these really precise measurements, we get a lot of noise, as you would expect. I mean, I'm gonna be real, my summer was spent analyzing noise. I think about five other students' summer in this program was spent analyzing the noise that LIGO sees. But in that, you get to know the instrument a lot. And it's really cool what kinds of things that they pick up on. So I was lucky enough to go to the Hanford site over the summer, which is the one over there in the desert looking area, um, which is in Washington state. And when I was there, I think there was a, an earthquake in Australia, but it was so small that no news source even reported about it because it was so minute, but somehow they knew that there was an earthquake in Australia. And the earthquake in Australia that was negligible to anyone living in Australia came and decoupled the detector at LIGO Hanford, which effectively means 
it knocked the system out of balance enough so that they couldn't take data because it was so affected. So like, just think about that. You're, you're just sitting there taking data. An earthquake that happens in Australia is affecting you more than it's affecting anyone in Australia. Like, what is that? <laughs> it's, it's pretty crazy. Um, I have I have some funny some funny stories which I may or may not tell depending on the time that I have. But just for a quick one, um, I was told that Livingston, it's in Louisiana, the Livingston site is actually by one of the PIs of LIGO. He said, it is the worst possible place in the world for LIGO, <laughs> like worse than, worse than New York City, worse than, I think he said California, like it is literally the worst possible place because of the earthquake or not earthquakes, because of the hurricanes they get. And then they also, you can't really see, but on either side of LIGO here, it's a hunting range. So, so just think about it. You don't see any barrier, right? Like you don't see any demarcation between the woods and LIGO. So somebody's just out there hunting, they stumble across LIGO and they shoot at it. No, I'm dead serious. <laughs> so they have all of these bullet holes along the lines of LIGO of this hundreds of million of dollar experiment. They have all of these bullet holes at the end stations. And so they ended up having to put an extra layer of concrete around the end stations because they kept getting these bullet holes. And they were worried about it, uh, a bullet actually penetrating and then destroying the vacuum because they basically had, in order to clean these arms, they had to cook these arms, I think for like 30 days at 150 degrees Celsius. So just so that they would get all of the hydrocarbons out of them. But what that means effectively is if they lost vacuum in any place on any of the arms, this entire experiment, this entire uh, area, or not area, this entire observatory would be out of commission. Like they wouldn't rebuild it. They would have to start it completely from scratch. They'd have to clean out every single part of it in order for it to actually work again. And so it's just kind of funny that they put it in somewhere where they have all of this hunting going on. And then they also have logging going on. So whenever a tree goes down in the vicinity, they lose coupling on the detector. <laughs> and so they just have this detector, which is always in like, always seeing these signals that they just shouldn't even be seeing because of hunting, logging, uh, apparently like a bridge collapsed. Like there's just all of these problems which make it really humorous. There are a lot of funny stories about the Hanford site that I can tell too, um, including LIGO staff members, uh, because it's on Department of Energy land, LIGO staff members having, they walked like I think, 10 feet outside of the radius of LIGO's actual property. So it, it's really funny the lengths that they went to to get LIGO to actually be in existence and then the, the struggles that they have to deal with on a daily basis just because of how precise these experiments are. So it's really cool. Okay, now I want to hear from you guys. How do you improve the sensitivity of the most precise system ever made? Like, I just want you to think about that because that's, that's something that everyone's struggling with there. I mean, you're thinking about the noise in the detector, but you have all of these outside factors. How are you able to deal with the effects of a hurricane slightly oscillating your test mass and then giving you a slightly weird reading during a gravitational wave event? or how are you able to make more precise detections when you're already getting these extremely precise detections? So if anyone wants to answer, you can. But I also hate being cold called in class. So I understand if you don't want to. <laughs> you can just think about it. Cool. OK, no worries. Let's talk about it. 
proposed improvement, Frosty. And this is talking about eliminating the losses that we get on the test masses slash the mirrors of LIGO. So again, you don't have to answer this, but I just want you to look at it. This is the total noise curve that we see. I'll use the little cursor. This black line is the total noise curve that we see in advanced LIGO. What dominates at noises that are higher than 100 hertz? This line. I'll let you think for a second. Yes, look it. OK, so we see that at frequencies higher than 100 hertz, quantum noise dominates the total noise. Now, from quantum mechanics, we know that photon shot noise will lower this quantum noise, and that the amplitude of the spectral density of shot noise decreases with a factor of 1 over the square root of n, where n is the number of photons incident on the mirror. Now, that's a lot of jargon. All you need to know is that the solution is higher laser power. That's how we are going to lower this quantum noise. That's how we're going to see better resolution at these higher frequencies. So why haven't we already done this? Well, I'll tell you. Um, the higher laser power has a lot of associated costs. So when you get higher laser power, you end up deforming the test mass more than it already does. Oh, no. All good. <laughs> um, so whenever we have a system that's this precise and we have a laser incident on the test mass, we deform the test mass. It just heats up. It changes curvature. That's just the way it is. But with higher laser power, it deforms it more than it's already doing. We have a system in place called the thermal compensation system, which tries to uniformly deform the surface and effectively make it so that even though the surface is already deformed, it's deforming something and making it flat so it's no longer an issue. Effectively eliminating the problem by making the problem worse. Um, yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, the issue with it, though, is that it's not equipped for higher laser power, and it actually makes it worse when we go to higher laser power. It augments the problem, it deforms the test mass surface so much more, and it just makes it everything more generally bad. We also see at higher laser power, aside from just this general deformation of the surface of the test masses, larger effects from these things called point absorbers, which are effectively just little, uh, little particles on the surface of the test mass that is different, has a different reflectivity than the rest of the test mass. So it causes the laser beams to scatter in ways that we can't really deal with. And we just can't deal with, with the thermal compensation system. So this is actually our loss currently where the dashed line is the ideal operating that we, we could be at with the power. And this little yellow area is our current predicted losses due to point absorbers. And you can see we're just, we have a lot of losses that aren't ideal and are really limiting the sensitivity of this experiment. So we have a solution, Frosty front surface type irradiator. This is the solution that my lab over the summer came up with. Um, it is a next generation annular ring heater that was designed to combat power losses from LIGO's test masses. So in Frosty, we are able to correct problems posed by both the thermal deformity of the test masses and the point absorbers by creating a precise wave front control technology that reduces power loss. Effectively, you're able to pinpoint specific areas on the test mass, which is drawn in blue here, and only heat up those regions so that we're no longer just applying uniform heat, which is what the thermal compensation system does. And we're able to pinpoint exactly where we need to add some heat in order to even out the surface of this test mass. 
here's the holdup. It still needs to be experimentally tested. That's why it hasn't been installed in LIGO yet. And that's where my project came in. So the issue for the, or the primary reason why this hasn't been installed into LIGO yet is that the noise in Frosty's heating elements has to be 100 times less than the quantum noise of a photo detector. Now, I've included this graph, well, one of LIGO's photo detectors, because in this gray line here, you can see the quantum noise of the photo detector, or effectively the noise of the photo detector. And you can see it's a bit lower than 10 to the 19. So how can we even make a measurement like that in a lab? We're talking about 10 to the negative 19. What even is that? How can we take that kind of measurement and not in LIGO? <laughs> it's, it's a completely abstract number to us at this point. So yeah, how can we measure noise on this scale? Well, I'll tell you, the Fermilab holometer, in this paper, they proposed a system in which you effectively take a time average of the power spectral density and the cross spectral density of laser light, and that gives you a noise intensity relationship that goes to the limits that we want it to. But let's take a moment to actually talk about what the holometer did and or is, because it's pretty fun. Um, as you can see on the, I guess, left picture, uh, this experiment will be able to tell us if the universe is a hologram. Now let that sink in for a second. What does that even mean? <laughs> well, I don't know. Well, no, I do. <laughs> so apparently, according to them, much like the characters on a television show would not know that their three-dimensional world is actually 2D in our world, uh, they, we could be clueless and not know if our actual three-dimensional world that we live in, it could be 2D or we could just be living in a hologram version. So they, they basically did this experiment over a long period of time, took 700, over 700 hours of data over these two interferometer signals and came to the conclusion that no, the universe is not a hologram. So you can all go to sleep tonight knowing, telling your philosophy friends, that no, we're not living in a hologram. So I, at least you can rest a little bit easier, I guess. <laughs> I can talk more about that later if you guys are interested too, but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, yeah. Effectively, as I already mentioned, the system that they used in order to get this measurement and tell us what we already needed, what we really needed to know, uh, was to use the power spectral density and the cross spectral density. And then they took a rolling time average over of these values computed from a continuous sig signal over this 700 hour time period. And that's what allowed them to get to these super low levels of sensitivity. And it will allow us in my code to get find noise values below LIGO's desired threshold. So exactly what we were looking for. So let's get into what I actually did. Uh, my goals, I wanted to create a program or GUI that would dynamically find the intensity noise performance of Frosty's heating elements. And then I wanted it to be able to plot both the CSD amplitude and the phase for a real-time noise analysis of the heating elements. And this is what I used to get the signal. This was my general uh, layout for my experiment. Uh, at the end of the experiment, I actually switched from using a green laser to using a function generator because I wanted to be able to see if specific frequencies were working equally well as other frequencies. And it also allowed me to uh, manually put in some white noise signals, which was really helpful in figuring out whether or not my code actually worked. 
Uh, in order to do this, I used this thing, which I is called a red pitaya, as I may have already mentioned, I don't know, uh, which is lovingly referred to on their website as a engineer's Swiss army knife, because it can serve as an oscilloscope, it can serve as a function generator, can really do anything. It's just kind of annoying sometimes, which I figured out. <laughs> oh, and I also want to mention that in my experiment, the cables connecting these sensors to the red pataya were the same length, so as not to introduce a phase difference in the signal that we read out by the red pataya. So let's get into the GUI development. Here is the pipeline for the GUI that I made, and we're going to go through it step by step. And yeah. First, obviously, we need to acquire raw data for this system. And to acquire the raw data, we need to communicate with the red pataya, because that was the main way that we were actually acquiring it. And as I said before, and I will say now, communicating with the red pataya was the primary cause of issues that I faced while developing this GUI. Um, I was actually talking to someone who is in CS at, in grad school, and she used to do hardware software interfacing. And now she switched to machine learning because she said that uh, hardware software interfacing like made her like grow a bunch of gray hairs <laughs> and made her life so much worse. <laughs> so she she was really she was really amazed that I got the red pataya to listen to me sometimes. <laughs> so after we acquire the raw data, we need to apply a Hahn window. And the Hahn window is a filter which can be applied to samples prior to performing a fast Fourier transform to clean the uh, FFT process up and prevent spillage of signals into unwanted frequency bins. And then, oh, after we took the Hahning window, we took a fast Fourier transform. Now, the fast Fourier transform, many of you probably know what this is, but I'm still going to tell you. A fast Fourier transform is a process which takes a finite list of time series data and then transforms it into the frequency domain. And it is extremely useful for signal processing and noise signal identification, which both of which I used in this project. Oh, we're good. So next we took the power spectral density and the cross spectral density, and I will finally define this for you guys. The power spectral density is the distribution of power received from a signal over the frequency range computed from a fast Fourier transform. And the cross spectral density is the distribution of power for two signals over that frequency range. So these were, these were really, really helpful and we wouldn't have been able to do this project without them, these tools. So then, we needed to take the time average of these values because that's the entire way that we're going to be able to ch achieve this sensitivity um, and actually be able to confirm that we can install Frosty and LIGO and not have it effectively destroy the entire system with its noise. So after that, we computed the statistical noise of the cross spectral density and now the statistical noise gives us a measure of how well we can trust our CSD and PSD values, but it's also super important, not just for the function of the GUI, but for how we can tell if the signal is good or not. How we can tell if the signal is behaving how we would expect, if we can trust the signal. And really it gave us kind of a rationale for whether or not we could actually implement this into LIGO and if we needed to uh, fix a lot of the things that we were finding with our with Frosty's behavior. So then after that, we needed to plot and save the data. Um, it wouldn't be much of a GUI if it didn't dynamically plot and display the data, and then also be able to save the peak noise frequency values and the values from the CSDs and the PSD, or CSD and PSDs um, as 
whenever we wanted it to. So here is the overall pipeline again, just for fun. And now let's talk about applying the GUI because we need to talk about whether it actually held up and did what we wanted it to do and whether we'll be able to actually install the, or use this to test Frosty and then install Frosty into LIGO. So this is the final GUI interface. Um, you can see it running, which I love to watch. Over time, this purple band that you see, it will get much skinnier, as in it'll look more like the yellow and green lines up top here. And it will also go down. So this is a sped up video of a 30 second segment of data that I took. Um, in reality, they're going to be running this for hours upon hours in order to get to 10 to the negative 19. But we can already see in this 30 second clip that the band gets skinnier and skinnier the longer we run it and it's dropping. And I also wanna mention something cool about this, which is why I included it, is because we can see the, if you look closely, you can see peaks in the frequency about every 60 hertz or kilohertz, or no, hertz, every 60 hertz. And that's because we were picking up on the electrical noise in the room because all of our outlets run at 60 hertz. So we were seeing the harmonics of the electrical signals in the room and seeing them over this huge frequency range at when we'd already tried to remove the red pataya from sensing anything in the room by wrapping it in aluminum foil to try and make a Faraday cage from it. So even, even when we make a Faraday cage, we're still picking up on these electrical noise signals because it's so sensitive even over, I took a maybe 30 minutes of data before I took this video and then I took this video for about 30 minutes or 30 seconds, so. Yeah, it's, it's really cool that we're able to see this. So here is a more important test that we did um, where you can kind of see the thinning of this purple band. And you can also see this large peak of power centered around the peak induced voltage. So effectively what I did here was I sent in a specific frequency with a specific voltage and then I also inserted a range of white noise and that caused this little bump that you see right around this peak. So it's really cool that we're able to see this little band of noise because we're seeing the power put into the band of noise. So we're seeing this little band of noise distributing the power that we put into this signal. And this, this alone confirms that this will work over for what it needs to do for Frosty. So that's really satisfying and really, really good. So project synthesis, the culmination of my work. So this GUI will be used to test the heater elements of Frosty, but it has potential for many other applications. This is a universal program which can be updated and used to find the electrical noise in any electrical system. So I actually had, after giving the shorter version of this presentation, uh, I had a few people who actually work in LIGO say that they're going to use it for a few of their other measurements because they need to find the intensity noise calculations of some of their electrical components. And this can be used for that because you can just update it to not use a red pataya, which is three lines of code that you comment out and then three more lines of code that you put in for it to interface with a different hardware. So that's really, that's really exciting. So now I just wanna say thank you. Um, Tyler was my grad student this summer. Dr. Richardson was my PI. Um, and I, I really had a great summer with them. Uh, Thank you to NSF, UC Riverside, the LIGO Laboratory, and the Caltech Surf Program. And if you need to, in your labs here, and or, and or for just personal use, use my GUI. 
you know, if you want to ever calculate the intensity noise of an electrical signal or a heater signal or anything you can dream of that can be converted into a, an electrical signal, feel free. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Any questions? If not, I can also talk for a little while about fun, more fun LIGO stories because they have a lot of one. Oh yeah, I have, so apparently uh, at Hanford on the Department of Energy land, they, uh, there was this guy who was riding in a dune buggy because he was part of the, mil so he's part of the military and they do a lot of trainings there. And he was riding a dune buggy coming from one of these like directions. And he, there's like a little, there's, there are little bumps so that you can't see above if you go down them right by the arms. And he was looking at a really old map because I don't know, he was in the military and they only gave him a really old map. And he didn't know that LIGO was there. And so he hit, he went, he jumped up off of the, he went down into the, the little area, he went up and he hit LIGO <laughs> and the dune buggy flew. It, total, it was totally destroyed. The guy broke his arm and he was mad at LIGO. <laughs> he wanted them to be like decommissioned, but they were like, we're already here. You're the one who didn't see the giant cement arm directly in front of you. <laughs> They actually have pictures of um, they have pictures of staff members, like I mentioned, uh, who have gone too far past the the barrier here, like like this. And they did they just hang them up in the lab <laughs> because it's so funny that so many of these high ranking like professional scientists have had to like be. Uh, be questioned by the military because they've stepped like a foot over the boundary that they're supposed to be. <laughs> um. Yes. So they have them. Oh, you mean like, like, like signs like out here? I don't know, I don't know if they're, like, I don't think they have a lot of, like, freedom since they're on the military land. I know that in Livingston, they have signs, and they have, like, a little fence, but people always go over it when they're, like, hunting their deer, and so then they end up still shooting the arms, <laughs> this extremely expensive vacuum system, and almost destroying it, yeah. Yeah. So we're in damping out using this pendulum, we are damping out external effects. So we're damping out the effect of like the earth on LIGO versus when we get a gravitational wave going through, it's going to change the position of this test mass. And so it doesn't matter that we're decoupling LIGO from the earth. What matters is that the gravitational wave is still going to move this test mass, the amount that we, a small amount in order to get that signal. So effectively by damping, we're changing a different signal. Like if we, may, if we didn't damp out those higher frequencies, we wouldn't even be able to see the motion on this test mass from this gravitational wave. But then by changing this, like I said, 
we're just not seeing those effects anymore and we're seeing the effect only on this bottom test mass from the gravitational wave. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually super interesting. Um, a lot of the projects this summer were specifically looking at LIGO data in which they see stochastic noise, like a gravitate or a, an earthquake, or they see like a hurricane somewhere, or they see somebody walking outside by the detector, or they see a bullet getting shot into the detector. And so some students this summer um, we're using machine learning programs or other types of software in order to find the noise signatures of these specific, uh, these specific events. And then they're able to identify it and then remove it from the noise. But I'm also going to be honest with you. Um, there was a student this summer who was in this program, and she was working on seeing whether or not all of our data is actually real. Like every gravitational wave that we actually measure, whether or not it is a legitimate gravitational wave. And she found that, no, effectively, she found that different programs that they use for telling whether or not something's a gravitational wave with the LIGO data uh, contradict. And they contradict on the wrong things in order, in that some of them say some things are gravitational waves, some of them say other things are gravitational waves. And then when you put them together, they actually find more gravitational waves. But then they, they agree that the ones that they didn't agree on are gravitational waves when they're put together. Effectively, they have a lot of data analysis to do in the next few years in order to, to determine whether or not we can actually trust the data that they've taken up till now. Um, they know that they're measuring gravitational waves and they know that some of the signals are real, but some of them might just be noise, and they, they, they don't know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you actually decouple when you, oh, well, let me backtrack for a second. They see these, I'm gonna be real, earthquakes look very different than the gravitational wave signals I'm sure you've seen. Um, but when you get an earthquake and it decouples both Livingston and Hanford, then they, they know it's an earthquake because it's so massive. But I think that they're able I think we have programs that are pretty easily able to identify whether or not something is an earthquake when it decouples the apparatus. But when we see a noise signature in a gravitational, a piece of gravitational wave data, that's a lot harder to determine. Um, something else you may have seen that's pretty amusing, um, at least in my mind, not to the people at LIGO, is that these uh, detectors are, were accidentally positioned in such a way that they can't get extra data from them. As in, in theory, they should have more dimensions available to them in the detections that they make. However, they aligned the detectors just right and that they can't get the, uh, the whole 3D, 2D view that they should be getting. Not 3D, 2D view, but Basically, they can't achieve the entire field of view that they should be able to achieve with the two detectors just because of the way that they aligned them by accident, or I think by the ways that they were allowed to on the plots of land that they were given. And so they're super limited by the fact that these two detectors are aligned as well, um, which is sad because of how much work is put in. But that's why we want more. <laughs>
Yeah. Yes. Um, I do know that they're planning on making that, and I think from what I hear, it is far in the future. And what I also hear is that they it still needs to kind of get off the ground. Um, I don't know mu too much more about it than that, but I know that it's not yet. But they're really excited about it because it'll be significantly lower noise. And that's everything that the people at LIGO are trying to achieve. Yeah, exactly. That's their plan. The The issue is that the real estate at the Lagrange points, I think, is quickly filling up. So maybe they should get it out there sooner rather than later. <laughs> yeah. Well, so it's kind of funny because a lot of the people who were originally working on the Fermilab Holometer project transitioned to LIGO. Um, and so we, since I was starting this project with these people, they kind of already knew that I needed to use the system that they used. Um, but the really funny thing about it is that they made this program I think like maybe like between, I think about 10 years ago, like somewhere within 10 years ago, but computer programs have uh, improved so much since then that a lot of what I was reading was extremely outdated. So I, <laughs> they were like, you need to do this part by hand and this will use this much of your processing power um, or this used this much of our processing power, but, I, I kind of needed to reinvent it, or I needed to reinvent a lot of it based off of the programs that are now accessible to us. Um, but it was cool because uh, whenever I would run into a problem, I would go and talk to them and they'd be like, oh yeah, the holometer had this issue too. Do like, this is what I did. And then sometimes it would work and sometimes it would be very outdated. <laughs> yeah. So overall, I think that it uh, improves the, the statistics that we see on detections. Obviously, in that, it will also improve our ability to make detections because, as I mentioned, gravitational waves have such a weak interaction with matter that there are so many gravitational waves that our test masses are experiencing that we just can't even, we can't even measure because our noise is way too high. So. Frosty is actually necessary for future improvements to LIGO. Um, and there are two major improvements to LIGO that are coming up, uh, LIGO A plus and LIGO A sharp, both of which are dependent on Frosty being like accessible and working in the LIGO system in order for us to one, get the higher laser power, get that sensitivity lower, and then also for us to be able to detect more gravitational waves and get the precision down to what they want it to be at. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know how to get there. Oh, okay. Q and A. Thank you for a great talk. May you talk a little bit more about showing? Okay, yes. <laughs> I have notes on this. So, so what they say is uh, apparently the information about everything in our universe could be encoded into tiny packets in two dimensions. Quantum theory suggests that it's impossible to know the exact location and exact speed of subatomic particles, as you know, Lucas. Um, 
But if space comes in 2D bits with limited information about the precise location of objects, then space itself will fall under the same theory of uncertainty. The same way that matter continues to jiggle as quantum waves, even when cooled to absolute zero, this digitized space should have built-in vibrations even at its lowest energy state. So effectively, this experiment is looking at the universe's ability to store information. Um, they treat the world as if it's bits, like a computer, which is kind of funny. Um, and they used the holometer, which is effectively, as I mentioned, uh, the... We'll go there. It's effectively two interferometers again. So uh, the holograph, or I'm going to just lay it out. Uh, the researchers analyze the fluctuations in brightness of the laser like they do with LIGO. And um, that is able, they're able to make a precise enough measurement to see like this jiggling of space. Um, the holographic noise, which is this noise that they're expecting, is expected to be present at all frequencies, but the scientists are trying not to be fooled by other sources of, of vibrations. Um, the holometer really had to reduce noise and isolate noise in this experiment in order for them to actually get to these Planckian limits um, and see whether or not we are living in, well, whether or not life is actually 2D. Um, they end up finding that, in fact, it is not. And we live in a 3D space, which is always nice. Um, always nice to know. Uh, I will also mention um, that this was running at Fermilab. So I asked some of the people who worked on the holometer experiment originally, like, how are you able to isolate these super sensitive interferometers from everything that's going on at Fermilab when you're running all of these electrical tests at super high energies? Just how are you able to isolate this? And their answer was they weren't, but over enough data and with enough shielding, the low level environmental factors ended up like canceling out, getting rid of themselves, being negligible. And so they were able to make this, this measurement. Um, but it's, I can't even believe that they did this at Fermilab just with the amount of experiments that are going on at any point in time. Oh, I think there's another thing. Oh, okay. I already answered live, okay. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So thank you, Sophia, for dealing with um, gun frenzied hunters and uh, crashing dune buggies. Um, just a few quick announcements. I mean, as you guys all know, I think every single person here has been to one of these lectures and has gone to the observatory. But in case there's anyone here who doesn't remember, uh, we are CAS. We are the Cornell Astronomical Society. Uh, we host open houses at Fuertes at the observatory by uh, Appel every Friday from 8 p.m. to midnight, which is right now. Uh, so if you guys have anything else to do, you should go there and look at well clouds tonight, but sometimes stars. Sometimes we get stars. Uh, and just some kind of more fresh announcement is that we have a telescope training tomorrow, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Should be much, not all much, but it should be de definitely significantly better weather. So that'll be nice for any new members who want to get more practice with the telescopes or just learn about the night sky. And um, it's a full moon. Yeah. So we'll look at that tonight. And thank you guys for coming. And thank you, Sophia, for talking. Oh. One more thing, sorry. We'll have one next week at the same time, same place. Uh, so hope to see you there. Thank you, guys.